Hey, Fiends. Uh, we mentioned in this week's episode that it's a bit of a crossover between us and the Last Book on the Shelf podcast, but at the time of this recording, we weren't sure how the schedules were going to line up. So I wanted to mention here at the beginning that this Friday, October 13th, you can catch Eric and I joining the Last Book on the Shelf guys to discuss the Dean Koontz novel that this week's film is based on. As usual, we had a lot of fun with the Last Book on the Shelf folks, so you don't want to miss that episode. It's a, it's a lot of fun. Uh, also, if you don't follow us on social media, you may not have heard that I am releasing a an album of songs based on the Friday the 13th film franchise. Uh, that will be available for pay what you want download uh, appropriately on Friday the 13th as well. Uh, you can head over to constantreader.bandcamp.com to find that, uh, and there will be links to all of this in the show notes as well. Thanks for listening, and take it away, Spooky Piano Man. The hosts feel it would be a little unkind to present this podcast without just a word of friendly warning. We are about to unfold the story of Frankenstein, a man of science who sought to create a man after his own image without reckoning upon God. It is one of the strangest tales ever told. It deals with the two great mysteries of creation, life and death. I think it will thrill you. It may shock you. It might even horrify you. So if any of you feel that you do not care to subject your nerves to such a strain, now's your chance to. Well, we've warned you. Hello, and welcome once again to the Frankencast. I'm the mad scientist, Anthony Bowman. My pronouns are he, him, and I'm joined as always by... The person in a vat that's covered in a mysterious milky white substance that is Eric Velasquez. My pronouns are also he, him. Yeah, so um, kind of got a little bit of a, a special crossover <laughs> episode thing this yeah. week. <laughs> so here we're going to be talking about the movie based on, the, or loosely based on the Dean Koontz novel Frankenstein. Uh, the, the first Frankenstein novel, which is called... Prodigal like, Son. Prod- Prodigal Son. I believe this was originally, like, it, before it was even a Koontz book, it was going to be a TV show that he was going to produce. And right. then there was, like, a lot of tension between him and, the like, the showrunners and stuff. And they basically parted ways, and they decided to make a movie, and he decided to make a novel, and it kind of branches out. But if you look at them next to each other, there's a lot of similarities. They were pretty well into the process, but then there's also a lot of differences. A lot of differences, yeah. We, yeah, we were just mentioning that. By the way, funny funny story, Anthony. Uh, so uh, for uh, a lot of my, well, I won't say youth, uh, my college years, uh, after a certain point, uh, I saw this on, like, USA Network at one point, mm-hmm. and I got really excited. I was like, oh, man, this looks really cool. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, and that was it. It's, this is the only one that existed. And I was like, where the fuck? Yeah. And back in 2004, it was a lot harder to find missing media than it is now for some reason. Yeah. Uh, yep. There was, yeah, physical media was, like, this kind of stuff you had to find in a store. Um, mm. You couldn't just, or, like, go to Amazon. DVD. Yeah. Uh, and then, yeah, like, you couldn't just... Uh, you know, download from, you know, any sort of... And there definitely was no streaming options, so... Unless you were pirating. That, right. that was about, about it. And then you uh, you either got a movie that had nothing to do with Frankenstein, a porn parody, or uh, a virus. <laughs> right. But yeah, I guess we should say... So the reason we're doing... Like I said, this is a crossover. Um, if you... Uh, I'm not sure the timeline about when these will be coming out, but... Uh, we're going to be discussing the book in further detail over on um, friend of the, sh- the show Hayden's um, podcast, uh, Last, Last Book, Book on, the, on shelf. the Shelf. Yeah. So it may already be out by the time you hear this, uh, but you should go over there and hear us talk to the guys about the uh, the book. Yeah, absolutely. So let's give a rundown of some of the people that are going to be in this uh, movie. We've got Parker Posey, who, mm-hmm. man, like for a long time they were trying to make her a thing, but for some <laughs> reason it just didn't stick, right? It's so strange. Like, I like her in pretty much yeah. everything she's in, but yeah, she's just, like, she was in Scream. The, yeah, or, Scream what, 3. Yeah. Blade, which, Blade Trinity. Mm-hmm. I think probably, like, the Christopher Guest movie she's been in is probably the best, like, her best work. Uh, mm-hmm. She's in Best in Show, I think. Maybe A Mighty Wind. I can't remember. But, like, she definitely has the right vibe for, like, the Christopher Guest, like, kind of weird, hyper-reality mockumentary style. Right. Um, 
And she's good in this, but clearly it didn't, you know, didn't really act as any kind of springboard for her. No, unfortunately not. But, you know, uh, that that Blade Trinity uh, <laughs> sure helped, I guess. <laughs> right. <laughs> but she was also in, what, the Lost in Space TV series, so she was the Dr. Mm-hmm. Smith there. I think, I think, weirdly enough, I think she's, like, more well-known now than she was then. Yeah, it's it's like, it seems like maybe people sort of, like, retroactively, like, appreciate her. Right. Uh, like, remember the thing, and like, man, we just, we didn't give her enough credit back when, uh, you know, it feels like she's one of those, like, actresses who's getting reevaluated, um, right. and, and getting a little bit more respect after the fact. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully she hasn't had... Well, there is a, a, what, Posey Parker that's a turf and a garbage human being. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, And I feel like she's still her name. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But let's also talk about uh, Deucalion, uh, who's also Vincent Perez. Do you know who Vincent Perez is, Anthony? I did not recognize him. Okay. So he was in one of my most favorite movies of all time that said no one ever, The Crow City of Angels. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, okay. But... But he was also in Queen of the Damned. He was Marius. Mm, He's one of the, okay. the main vampires there. Gotcha. Yeah, gosh. Fucking Crow City of Angels, man. Like, <laughs> the most unnecessary fucking sequel, I think. Oh, absolutely. Basically. Yeah, especially, like, considering everything that happened around that movie, I feel like they should have just, like, let it lie. Like, it didn't. It didn't need a sequel anyway, but considering the circumstances, it really didn't need a right. sequel. The main actor of the original died on set. Yeah. And then we got Michael fucking Madsen. Mm-hmm. Which, Who, you know, He's Kill great Bill. in everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah Kill I mean, Bill especially. He's Michael but Madsen. That, yeah, and he's fantastic in this. Like, he... Uh, the only, uh, my only complaint about him is that, like, he exudes so much sinister energy that, like... It's not a surprise right. when he turns out to be a bad guy later. Like that, it, it's not very a very well done twist in that regard. No, it is it is very much like oh yeah yeah okay that that's, that's legit. I kind of <laughs> yeah. figured that anyway, right? <laughs> right. And he plays. I love. This is true for the character in the book too, named Harker. But mm-hmm. Harker Harker isn't the person in the book that this guy is in the, in the movie. There's yeah, a divergence yeah. there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, so our, our main detectives are, are Parker Posey and um, Adam Goldberg, who's like mostly does like comedy stuff, but he's really, I mean, which he's kind of a comedic character in this. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I liked him in this. Um, but then they what? sort of have like rival detectives, which are Detective Harker and Detective Fry. Fry. Dwight Fry, so, I believe, is his actual name. Yeah, so we get some other monster movie references and stuff, which is nice. And those yeah. names, yeah, like you said, they both carry over from the book. So. Um, Koontz was making those references as well. Yeah, I think it's interesting they made Adam Goldberg kind of an action hero. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, all right, it worked. I mean, it's fine for for who he is. Yeah, wasn't he? Um, wasn't he the Hebrew Hammer? Did you ever see yeah. that? There was like a yeah. sort of action comedy where he was like a kind of a cop or a detective or something. Right. Well, he was also that really intense friend uh, guy in Friends. The roommate and friends, Joey's, yeah. I think it was. Yeah, and there's um, and then I guess uh, Erica, the uh, Victor's wife, is um, what Ivana Milesevic, who's like, mm-hmm. I think mostly a model, but she's she's acted in some other things as well. Yeah, I think those are the biggest notables. Mm-hmm. And I guess we should also say this is directed by Marcus Nispel, who mostly directs music videos, but in the movie world is most uh, has done the Texas Chainsaw Massacre remake and the Friday the Thirteenth re- remake. So right. uh, this is one of his like rare original movies, even though it's also an adaptation and you know sort of a remake slash sequel, you know. Yeah. So, that's that's it. And well, that scans because I rem- the beginning intro of the the movie is basically a Tool music video, mm-hmm. and like I remember the closing was very similar to that in the original, but in the version we watched, it wasn't like that at all. Yeah, but it was very much you know this is kind of a, a 2004 rock metal mm-hmm. video. Yeah, it, it seems like around this time period, a lot of like music video directors were getting hired to be film directors and it kind of shows like this time period a lot of the movies feel like they were made for people with short attention spans like 
which I guess is still the case now, but like th- there's definitely a music video vibe to this this whole movie. Yeah, and if you believe IMDb, apparently this was co-written by Mary Shelley herself. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty impressive. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, that's a good gag, though. Mm. All right. All right. So let's talk about this thing. Yeah. So we we start out. We've got like a ship on the ocean. Um, it's like an establishing shot, and then we see the below deck. There's like a a young like Chinese t- teenager. He's carrying. Yeah, don't tr- come at us because literally it says Chinese man screaming mm-hmm. or Chinese screaming. Yeah. Um, he, he's carrying a tray of food, um, and he's like, what, you know, it's like just, you know, the standard issue below deck of a boat. There's like leaky pipes everywhere. There's steam coming from things. There's sparks coming from things. What's sparking? Yeah. I don't know. Not Seems the like safest below deck. I feel <laughs> yeah. like there's some issues. Uh, this isn't up to code for sure. <laughs> but he eventually finds a, a man who is like in a cloak and uh, like a hood. We can't really see much of his features. And for some reason, they're talking to each other, and they both seem to understand, but right. one's, one's speaking Chinese and one's speaking English. It makes no sense. I don't know why that would be the way they would communicate. Right, um, Ver- versus just talking in whatever language they decided. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but then another guy shows up who seems like he's you know some kind of security guard or whatever. He um, may be the captain, who knows, but he starts roughing up the kid. Yeah, instantly just like starts beating the shit out of this kid. And at first I was like... Is this other dude not gonna help? But he right. kind of like flanks the the captain. Thanks or, for or, you. Fa- thanks for the food. Fuck you, kid. Yeah, uh, but he ends up. You know, he snaps this dude's neck and and kills him. Yeah. Um, then I think the next thing we see is just that that hooded figure walking away from the ship as it has now docked, and he's just like in the foggy streets of New Orleans at night. Right, and then we uh, yeah exactly, and then we cut to. Uh the the intro that we were talking about, mm-hmm. yeah, which I described as a new metal music video with like exactly. science stuff, and it's like yeah. quick shots of graveyards and static and lightning bolts, and you know just just a lot of good Frankenstein stuff, real quick. Well, you and also got that uh, the stop motion stitching that was really popular, <laughs> even with Coraline and stuff like <laughs> that intro. Yeah, it's like uh, man, nobody talks about that aesthetic, right? <laughs> Because yeah. it was in everything, or it seems like it. Yeah, true. All right, but then we get a bunch of kids laughing around a fire hydrant that's been bust bust open. Presumably, you know, that's that's their water park. Yeah, exactly. And we're supposed to be in New Orleans, right? Mm-hmm, yeah. And so we there's a police car that pulls up and stops, and the kids all kind of freeze, like, oh, no, we're <laughs> in trouble. Uh, but the there's, like, a, a woman cop. This is Parker Posey. And she just kind of, like, waves at them, like, you're good. You keep doing what you're doing. Yeah. Um, and then, like a guy, uh, Adam Goldberg gets out of, you know, walks out of a house and jumps with in the a bunch of donuts. Seat. Yep, and they start kind of like, they're they're like they're partners, but they're also like they're very friendly. They're like joking, like she's making fun of him for having donuts and being a you know a cop cliche, but then she Seriously, still yeah. steals the best donut out of the bag and eats it for herself. Right, it's rude, very rude. <laughs> but so another big departure from this one is. All right, we, t- we immediately find out this is murder number three. Well, in the book at this point, there's been six. Mm-hmm. So, so we're cutting out three other people. Yeah. Ha! Sorry. And we'll also get their names. So Parker Posey is Detective Carson O'Connor. Connor. And he's and, Michael Sloan. Yeah, which they changed it. Like, that's not his name in the book. I don't know why they right. changed the name, but... Um, why not, right? Yeah. It's, it's more more uh, hetero that way or more cis that way, right? <laughs> Machismo. Guess. Yeah. Why not? So, and then we cut away uh, to the the guy in the the hooded cloak. He's walking down a street, and he enters uh, like an old rundown movie theater. Just kind of busts up in there. Mm-hmm. And he's just kind of like wandering around, and then we see there's like a an older black lady who hears the commotion and is like, you know, trying to figure out what's going on. She has like a big flashlight and is walking around. And Did they, they eventually give her a name. I don't think they did, and she's not from the book, so I don't know what her name would have been otherwise. Well, she's replacing uh, Jelly. Yeah. So she they, they bump into each other, and he's like, you know, I'm looking for Ben. Yes. And um, she's Luckily, like... Luckily, Ben still remains, even though he's not a character in the other <laughs> one. Yeah, and she's like, no, you, you just missed him. He died, like, just recently, He's so he's gone. Um, yeah, he got jumped. Yeah, got mugged and, and shot. 
and um, she's like, but I've heard about you. I, I was kind of expecting you. Um, he told me about your time that you, you worked together in the freak show, basically. Yeah, whereas in the book they have this big talk about, you know, Deucalion's past, where he was in the freak show, and that's how he met uh, Ben, and J- Jelly was part of that to a degree, but after mm-hmm. uh, Deucalion left. But here it's just like, yep, we just bring up the freak show. You would have been a great freak. He's like, I was. I was called the monster. Yeah. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah. We know. Deucalion's <laughs> the creature, right? Yeah. Yeah. As you, so, like, that's, that's where we get his name, which, um, if you look that up, that's... Deucalion in mythology is the son of Prometheus, you know, obviously, you know, Frankenstein, the modern Prometheus. So it's it's on the nose, but it, it's it's nice. Yeah, it's a good reference. Um, and then we yeah. cut back King to our detectives Pythia. who are uh, at their their crime scene, which is at the library. Um, and right, they bunch in. That's a later, not later murder in the book, but mm-hmm. it's definitely not one of the first. Yeah. Yeah, they're definitely streamlining this. I guess, you know, I, I understand that for, like, the novel's pretty thick and, you know, this being, you know, just like an hour and a half. And right. especially it being, like, a pilot, maybe. Yeah, they also cut out a character that basically is Yoshikage Kira, uh, if you're a big JoJo's Bizarre Adventure fan. <laughs> Look that up. It's a reference. <laughs> mm, okay. <laughs> he likes hands. Let's just say that. Mm, okay. Yeah. They're at the crime scene. They bump into their sort of, like, rival detectives, Harker and Fry. Fry. We'll find out that there's this serial killer. You know, this is, like, this, you know, like you said, this is murder number three. Um, mm-hmm. And they're calling him the surgeon. Yeah, it looks like he's taken out the heart of this uh, Bobby Allwine guy. Mm-hmm. And so the previous victims obviously had other body parts removed, so that's the, the MO that they're looking for. The two sets of partners kind of argue. It seems like the, the Harker and Fry sort of want this case. And, um, yeah. You know, Carson and uh, Sloan. Well, they're or, the grizzled detectives, right? Mm-hmm. So, yeah. yeah. Um, and, like, as they're... I think it's, like, Sloan is kind of arguing with Harker and Fry while Carson's looking at the crime scene, and she stands up and is like, "There's there was no struggle here. Um, right. this it's like doesn't, just sat there and took yeah, it. Yeah, let it happen. Yeah. So that, that's strange. Did anyone see the body? Nancy Whistler. Yeah, so th- this is the like the head librarian, and they're like, "Okay, where is she?" And it's like, she went into the bathroom, and she hasn't come out. She's been in there a while. Yeah. So turns out she's been puking every time mm-hmm. she thinks about it. Yeah, so. she's having a hard time processing what she saw. Yeah. Um, but so you know, Carson and Sloane go inside and talk to her, and you know, Car- uh, Sloane keeps like making jokes that are like upsetting her. Um, right? Do you think it was a souvenir? Maybe sexual gratification? Or, you know, dinner. <laughs> you know. <laughs> right, yeah. Um, but she's she's like, you know, I didn't like... So Allwine, the victim, was like a security guard at the library. And she's like, I didn't like him. He was kind of a creep. But, like, he didn't deserve to have his heart cut out. So, like, you know, it's it's, it's upsetting. They pretty much, they just cut to... They've gone to Allwine's apartment now. They're going right. to check out, see if there's any kind of clue there as to what might be going on. Um, right, and, and of course, because this is, once again, the early 2000s, versus... I, I don't want to keep dragging it back to the book. It's just, it's different from the book. Uh, instead of being painted a certain color, it's just dilapidated. Mm-hmm. Dilapidated. Yeah, yeah. The, like, yeah, the, the book has a very specific sort of description of the, the apartment that I, I would have been interesting to see. Uh, but, but here, but yeah. But could you, just... like, the way it's described, I, it's like, I feel like they tried it and they were like, this is not filmable at all. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think it would have been just, yeah, too difficult to make look right um so yeah it's just run it is it's painted black but it's mostly just run down there's a lot of junk everywhere he looks like he's been a hoarder you know there's like stacks of newspapers everywhere there's a bunch of cats roaming around right so it's got to smell great yeah the one thing that is the same across both of them that's important is they go into the bathroom and there's a wall that's just covered with like little straight razor blades stuck like sticking out and then a bunch hanging from strings from the ceiling as well. Yeah, I call that the Tales from the Crypt murder room. Because <laughs> uh, what is that uh, What is that uh, segment that's in, like, every version of Tales from the Crypt? Blind alleys, that's what it is. Mm, okay, yeah. You know, what they're getting from this is, like, oh, okay, all wine was super fucked up, too. Like, we don't know about the murder or what, you know, but, like, there, there's something going on here. This is bigger yeah. than just a murder. Right. So let's uh, cut back to Duke Alien now. He's in... Uh, He's in the theater with uh, 
the lady who I'm just going to call Jelly because that's easier for me. Yeah, yeah. And she uh, brings him a lockbox uh, with all kinds of clipping of clippings of Victor Helios. Mm-hmm. Victor Helios. That's weird, Anthony. Yeah. And as soon as as soon as the Kalian looks at the clips, we have like a flashback, and we see a Frankenstein creation. You know, we get uh, you know a, a pretty traditional short little scene of like you the know mon- the, like the creature almost mummified. Bandages yeah, everywhere. yeah sparks and you know electricity all, all the stuff that we're used to seeing plenty of and then when we cut back to like the present to Kalian's like I, I've come here to New Orleans to kill Victor Helios he's you know oh, no. laying it all on the table he's my creator I, but he's evil and I'm gonna stop him fair enough all right we've got stakes now yeah which takes us directly to we, we then cut to Helios's home where they're in the process of getting ready for a big dinner party I'm um, like legit straight from the book. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He's checking out the glass, making sure it's all perfect, no fingerprints. Uh, yeah. But he tells one of the helpers, hey, the flowers, they're not right. Yeah, and they're like, oh, well, you know, Mrs. Helios personally arranged them, and he was like, well, fix them. She clearly doesn't know what she's talking about, basically. Like, right. uh, we don't have to t- tell her about it, but but make them right. Yeah. Um, and he's then, a dick. We know he's a dick now. Yeah, he, he clearly is a perfectionist. And, like, you know, is more concerned about things being exactly the way he wants them than, like, his wife feeling like she's, a, you know, contributing part of the family or whatever. Right. Um, Speaking of his wife, he come, he then walks in on her and uh, notices that she's made herself up for mm-hmm. the night. But he says, you can't improve upon perfection. And he literally forces her to take the makeup off. He yeah. wipes it out off of her face. Yeah, like, smudges her lipstick with his thumb, like, you know... And she's like, I just, you know, I wanted to look good for you. And he was like, I made you the way I, I wanted you to be. Stop messing right. with it. <laughs> right. um, yeah, so. Don't uh, have any agency. How dare you? Right, yeah. and it, I mean, and the way he, like, wipes it off is very rough. You know, I mean, like, it's clear that, like, she is an object. And he is trying to get her just the, the same way as the flower arrangement. The, the arrangement's not exactly the way I wanted. It needs more or less of, you know, this or that. And the same thing with, you know, with his wife. She needs to look the way he wants her to look right and because she's actually a person she knows that hey your your standards are a little high there you know i don't think anybody could live up to those mm-hmm. yeah i mean yeah. that sounds like victor right oh yeah Any victor <laughs> just about. true right and then we cut back to our police and they are in like the uh, the station like garage it's just harker and carson actually harker is you know as we said this is you know, Michael Madsen being kind of, like, creepy and, and, like, intimidating. And he's like, the victim at this place didn't match the surgeon's previous victims. There was something not quite right about, you know, the, w- the way the killing took place. Um, right. Maybe should we, we should call this assisted suicide and just be done with it. And yeah. Just quit. He wasn't bound and gagged, like, the, you know, and he, he's like, it seemed like maybe, you know, some goth helped him. And, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a murderer. And, and I like, love that her response is immediately, I, I was a goth, goth in high school. It's like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, okay, I'll yeah. buy that. Yeah, she was like, I'm, I, I take offense to that. Yeah. She even tells them, hey, you guys need to stop piggybacking on our case. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. Leave us alone, let us do our thing. Yeah, and he was like, I mean, but, you know, you saw the apartment. Like, it, it, there's something weird going on with Allwine. And she was like, yeah, you, you shouldn't have seen the apartment. That's not your case. You're not supposed to be there. Right. Stay out of it. And then we go back to Helios' house where the dinner party is now in full swing. Everyone's talking very self-importantly about science. And, like, you know, it's very, like, it sounds like something out of, like, an Ayn Rand novel. Like, everybody just thinks they're, like, you know, super important and, like, you know, the the top of, you know, social class. Well, I feel like Victor then, he kind of dog whistles a little bit. He's like, I believe that power should be in the hands of those with vision. And, Mm -hmm. like, that sounds, that sounds a little gross. A little yeah. 1940 something. Mm-hmm. Yep. There's also attending. There's a there's a priest, mm-hmm. and somebody's like, well, "What do you think about this?" And he's like, "Well, you know, I've been to a lot of parties here, and if I want to keep coming to these parties, I'm gonna say I agree with Victor. Victor's right." And then like he that's that's all he says, and everyone's like, oh, "Okay, right. I guess I stand corrected. The the priest is on your side, Victor." Well, everyone thinks he's joking. <laughs> he's not joking. <laughs> no, no, not at all. We also during the dinner we see that they're like. I think, you know, Mrs. Helios notices the flowers and kind of says something, and he's just like, he Drop just kind it. of shuts her down. Um, oh, yeah. Very uncomfortably, too. In the middle of the whole conversation, he's just like, zip, 
Yeah, yeah. There, there's definitely tension there, and everybody's a little uncomfortable that they're, you know, sort of witnessing that. Um, yeah. Then we cut back to Decalion, who is reading the news, uh, like reading a newspaper and seeing stuff about the surge and killings, and is like, this is this has got to be part of everything that's going on here. Like, he's right. putting He also sees together. a picture of O'Connor, and he's like, hey, maybe this mm-hmm. is the person I need to be helping. Yeah. So then we come back to Victor uh, doing Erica doggy style. Mm-hmm. And, you know, this is a pretty brief scene, and, like, it seems like, you know, she's not entirely into it, and he is... In fact, this is, you know, it's, it's like, kind of rough, and then all of a sudden he just kind of gives up, and then she starts, like, apologizing. Yeah, nobody, nobody gets to enjoy that. Yeah, I, yeah, it doesn't go well, and, and she's like, you know, I want to be desirable for you. And he's like, yeah, usually you are, but tonight I just need to go work. Like, I can't focus right. on anything. And so I'm in a creative leaves. mood, is what he says. Yeah. This is one big difference between the, the book and the movie that, like, I think I'm pretty much okay with. Like, his sort of, like, sex life in the books is, like, it's really unpleasant. Like, he's mm-hmm. he's very, not. it's not S&M, like, he likes abusive sex and that's like a big part of the book and it's yeah. it's not necessary it's kind of like no. we know victor's the villain we don't need that level of so it, it was nice that they kind of that was one of the things they decided to streamline yeah there's a lot of unnecessary stuff in the book but we'll talk about that eventually <laughs> yeah. Later thing. yeah but um, uh yeah we also get to see he has a really interesting spinal column because we're looking at his back yeah yeah we see like yeah he's you know he doesn't have a shirt on we see him from behind and it's like an exposed spine, you know, sticking out of his skin, but it's, like, really big, and it looks like it's, like, made of metal or something. Like, it's yeah. not just bone. It's Instead of the vertebrae, it's just, like, V, v like, mm-hmm. metal bars. Yeah, it's not just, like, a thin spinal column. Like, it's it's wide and, and strange. Like, it, they talk about it a little bit in the book, and I kind of was picturing, like, the spine from, like, the, the character in Dead Space... Yeah, but that's more just like a you know a standard metal spine. This is like this kind of broad, strange thing. Then we cut back to Carson and Sloane, and uh, Sloane's like, "Why don't we? We we've done a lot today. Like, let's let's you know call it a night. Let's let's rest for a little bit." Carson's like, "No, I, I want to go to the morgue. I want to find out what the ME found out." Then Sloane gets a call. And it's the the Emmy who's like, yep, we're ready. So he's like, okay, fine, let's go do that. I've got something good to tell you. Yeah. So let's go back to Victor and his lab full of animals. And he gets, he just gets a, a, what, a call? Yeah. Just a random call? Yeah, his phone rings. um, And it's it's someone who identifies themselves as one of his creations. Um, Literally, if you look from the back, you can tell exactly who it is. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's it's not at all a... uh, and, and they, like, twist. slightly tried to make him disguise his voice a little bit. Kind of. Like, he just kind of, like, is a little bit more raspy and whispery. But, like, yeah, you can also tell. It's Michael Madsen. Yeah, it, it's Michael Madsen. Um, and he's like, you know, I'm, I'm one of your creations, and I'm beginning to change. I've killed three men. Two were mm-hmm. regular people, and one was one of yours. There's something going on inside of me. Yeah. And Victor's like, you know, come to me. I can help you. I can. We can figure this out. Um, and he's like, do you watch the news? And then, like, hangs up on him. Right. So. But also note that he has a uh, sacred heart tattoo on his back. Mm-hmm. Yep, we will get more about that um, before too long. Mm-hmm. So they arrive at the morgue. Yeah, and the the medical examiner is like, this was strange. Like, this guy had two hearts, and they were like, well, I thought you said the heart was removed. And he was like, yeah, but, like, you can tell there's all the, the hookups. Like, there were two hearts right. that are both gone now. Um, and they're like, oh, so he Not was like... Not only that, but his, his bones were heavily calcinated. Yeah, like, he was like, they ba- they were basically like concrete level strength. Um, and, you know, his liver was really big. And there's a couple organs here. I don't even know what they are. Like, th- there's... Yeah. like So you're saying he was like a, a, you know, a freak or something? A mutant? And he's like, no, like, this was this was intentional. Like, this is, this is a, the next stage of evolution. Um, right, well, guided evolution, sure. Yeah, like, this is an improvement on humanity basically Mm -hmm. uh and you know they're obviously like that doesn't like (laughs) that how that doesn't make any sense how could that be um so with that they are like let's just call it a night we can't really process this tonight um and carson's like i need to go check in on my brother anyway and then we cut to vicky who's uh assisting o'connor at the house yeah, so this is, yeah, like a, a nanny, and this is where we, we meet. Which, uh, another thing, so like in the 
book her brother's name is Archie and here it's Anthony I'm fine with that but I don't I don't know <laughs> I don't know why like it doesn't really seem like that would matter in any way but like in the book he is severely autistic, autistic and yeah. um, thankfully it's not as like they don't dwell on it as much if you want to hear me really rant about this go over to the last book on the shelf because I'm gonna have some <laughs> stuff to say you got about feelings about that <laughs> Yeah. yeah. No joke. <laughs> yeah, here he's mostly just kind of like a background character that that you don't really get much from. But, you know, it, it, he's he's nonverbal. He has his own room where he's just like building an elaborate castle out of blocks. Um and, you know, Vicky is the nanny that watches him while uh while uh, Carson is away, you know, doing Now, why did stuff. they change her ethnicity? She's supposed to be Asian, right? Mhm. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Um, and, you know, so while, uh, Carson is talking, you know, sitting with Anthony, um, Sloan and Vicky are talking and, you know, he's just, you know, he, he's, he's the wisecracking guy. Like he's just, he's having a beer, he's joking with her and she's like, what are you going to tell Carson that you love her? And he's like, what do you mean? I don't. And she's like, come on, I come on. And he's like, all right, yeah, fine. (laughs) But yeah, not, not yet. No, no, we're not that part part in the series, and we'll never get there. <laughs> right. Carson comes back down, and she's like, okay, I've been thinking, and I want to go back and look at all Wine's apartment again. I'll take you home first, though, because I just, I need to just kind of, like, be in the space and, and think. And he's like, oh, you're going to use your psychic powers? Yeah. Uh, and she's like, yeah, pretty much. Um, <laughs> I have those. Uh, <laughs> then we cut to Victor talking to the priest, and he asks him a weird question. He's like, do you ever, you ever dream? You ever have any dreams? It becomes pretty quickly clear that this priest is, is also creation. a creation of Victor's, yeah. um, and you know he, he says like that he he needs help that there's a rogue creation out there and like he wants uh, Father Patrick's his name he wants him to like kind of check around with the various creations around town and see if anybody has heard anything. Um, Which is, that's a great storytelling element. The fact that he's already seeded his people into society. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and he's like, you know, I, I'd like to have him back to experiment on and talk to, yeah. but dead or alive, I, I, yeah. I need the body. So Dead so, or alive, uh, you're coming with me. Yeah. Uh, and so Victor gets up and he's like, God, God bless, bless you, you Patrick. <laughs> and Patrick like, looks up at him like, what? And he's like, that, that was that's a joke. joke. <laughs> um, yeah. Which, yeah, I liked that. Yeah. I feel, I feel like book Victor wouldn't, wouldn't be that funny now. <laughs> yeah. Then we go back to Carson, who is now at uh, Allwine's apartment again. Keeps searching around. She sits down, and he has like a recliner chair, and she mm-hmm. sees that like there's big rips in the hand re- like where your hands would be on the armrest. Like he kind of dug into them. Mm-hmm. And she kind of digs down in there and finds like fingernails. Like he's dug in there so hard he's like breaking his nails off. Could you imagine? Like yeah. you're a designer human, and somehow you break your nails and. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, one would assume, like, if his bones are yeah. concrete, his nails are also very strong. Um, so, yeah. So she keeps kind of walking around, and she goes into the bathroom and ends up finding there are a bunch of... It's hard to tell what they are at first, but we'll yeah. end up finding out they're, like, memorial cards from, like, a funeral home. Just, like, pictures of people with, like, you know, info about them on the back that are, like, floating in the bathtub. And then suddenly... And she gets a surprise... Yeah, Ducal- so surprises Ducalion. Yeah, yeah. So he's he's there, and, you know, Ducalion obviously, like, is seeking her out. As we mentioned, you know, he saw her in the newspaper and thinks, like, this could be an ally in my fight against Victor. But he's not very helpful here at first. No. Like, he... He's talking to her, you know, I mean, I know he's got a lot of, like, big information to reveal to her, and that's going to be hard to share, but he's... He's very theatrical about all of it. Mm-hmm. Um, he's, it's very cryptic, and he's like, you know, I, I'm like all wine. We were not made by God. Um, right. And she's if like... If you want to kill me, you'll need two bullets. Yeah. Uh, which, th- I think that's the thing that really sells her, because, like, you know, obviously she knows that all wine had two hearts, but she wouldn't... No one else should know that, so the fact that he does kind of indicates that he is connected to this in some way. Yeah. Uh, and he's, and I like know, how he's like, I'm made for the parts of serial killers and murderers. Being very edgy about it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, you know, he he also, you know, kind of confirms her suspicion and says that Allwine was suicidal, but he was unable to kill himself, so he must have had yeah, a partner. Help. Yeah. She's like, I, I need to find his killer still, no matter what. And Deucalion's like, 
your enemy isn't the killer, it's the, the maker killers. of the killer. And then he does go on to kind of, like, sort of loosely explain that, like, you know, he was created by Victor Helios slash Frankenstein, and that, like, lightning was his, the force that brought him to life, and so he, like, takes a power cord and cuts it and, like, grabs it with both hands to show that he's, like, made of electricity, but, like, the sparks are flying so much that she gets blinded and looks away, and then when she looks back, he's just gone. Yeah, he does a Batman. Mm Mm-hmm, 100%. Yeah. Then we just... Oh, she goes to visit... um, The therapist. Yes. This is like a, you know, a police psychiatrist who, like, specifically helps them. Is her name Catherine? Something like Uh, that. Her name is, yes, Kathleen. Kathleen. Kathleen Berg. But they're, like, they're also friends, you know, so she's like, you know, I'm I'm not sure if I'm here as a friend or as a a client at the moment, but let me tell you what just happened to me. So she kind of like gives her the rundown of her interaction with the Kalian. You know, I don't, I don't know what to believe at this point. And Kathleen's like, it sounds like it's what he wanted you to believe. And I think it sounds like you want to believe it too. Believe it as well. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's how trip magic tricks work is that the magician wants you to see something and, and you, you want, want it to it. be that way. So like yeah. you, you know, you, you let yourself be fooled, which is funny because you know, he, his thing is like, coin tricks basically mm-hmm. yeah so then it's just the next day carson picks up sloan and she's like i've got a new lead let's go to the funeral home she's like i found a bunch of these little memorial cards in all wine's apartment way more than like if he was just you know if he'd gone to somebody's funeral like this is right. a, this is a hobby yeah so they talk to the funeral director who is like yeah you know that guy came a lot at first it was like oh this poor guy he's you know coincidence a couple of people he cares about you know he's lost them uh, but eventually we started to realize that like this is a thing that he's doing you know yeah. or that they're sure. doing he specifically right. like, he's like there were there he were two guys yeah yeah he had a friend that that didn't come every time but came a lot um and you know they, they didn't cause any trouble so we just said you know welcome hi and just let them do their thing and yeah. uh so i don't really know anything about him beyond that it was just like any of the other patrons that came through like i just and you know he just was here a little more often than most Right. Could you give us a description of this guy? He's completely ordinary of average height and average weight with brown brown or blonde hair. So he's <laughs> yeah. a video game protagonist. Gotcha. Yeah. And, he, you know, uh, Sloan's like joking like, oh, yeah, that, that helps so much. And he's like, yeah, you know, I, just, I have a really good eye for detail. Like he's just completely <laughs> sure, oblivious. You sure do. Yeah. Yeesh. Yeah. This is pretty funny. Yep. Um, it's a good scene. And so then they get uh, – Sloan gets a call again and they're – was a fire at the morgue and it destroyed all wine's body Everything. and all the paperwork. That's such a weird mm. coincidence. All evidence. It's like a cover up. Uh, yeah. So yeah, the, that's definitely something I think at that point, like Carson is like, you know, she's starting to like think, okay, Ducalian's right. There's something bigger happening here. Something's going on. And yeah. Sloan's looking at her and he's like, you know something or you're thinking something and you're not telling me. And she's like, I'm not quite ready to yet. I'm like still mulling it over. But when the time's right, I'll tell you what's going on or what I think's going on. Okay, fair enough. Um, and so then Carson heads back home and when she gets there, the, the door is open. Yeah, and it's unlocked. And she's like, hey, Vicky, was someone here? And I love it because this is a bit. It becomes a bit. And Vicky's like, no, nope, nobody's here. Yeah. Nobody's been here all day. Other yeah. Than me and Anthony. Yeah, so um, Carson goes up to check on Anthony, and he is holding a ticket stub for the Joy Theater. A.K.A. Ducalian's house. Yeah, yeah. So obviously that's Carson's next stop, is to go see what's going on at that theater. Uh, and she finds Ducalian there, and they, they start talking. And this is one of the moments where like this movie gets into like autistic bullshit, because yeah. uh, Ducalian says... Your brother is a heavy burden that you carry with grace. Uh, uh, and it's like, he's just a kid who plays with blocks. Right. Like, he might not, he does he's, he seems to be nonverbal for the most part, but, like, he doesn't seem to be a heavy burden. Like, he's just doing his thing. Uh, yep. You know, uh, Carson has a nanny to, to watch him when she's away. Seems fine yeah. to me. Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, that, that was annoying to me. Is, um, is it here or later that he busts out the bullshit of, his he sees much, but his mind can't comprehend that which he sees, or some bullshit like that. Yeah, I it's think like, that's nah, a little bit autistic. later, but yeah, but yeah, yeah, he's yeah. like, it's yeah, that he, it's that like you know, anybody who's like 
atypical is like magic you know they're, right? they're either they're either handicapped or they have like you know it's like they have the shining or something it just can't right. just be like you're just a person um but... did we mention shit weasels <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> right yeah that's well yeah that's one of stephen king's worst for sure as far as that kind of thing well it's one of his worst period but it's definitely one yeah. of his worst as far as that trope goes as well yep um uh, here you know after he says that like he's like i think you know let me tell you about victor helios i think you can help you know and so he kind of gives her the full rundown and she's like so you're saying like he's some kind of frankenstein and he's no, like, it's based on Victor Helios, but yeah, I mean, basically, yes. Yeah, yeah, he says Frankenstein is the fiction and Helios is the fact that it was based on. Right. Um, in the book, I think he's literally Victor Frankenstein and he's changed Frankenstein. his name, whereas yes. here he is just Victor Helios and it's just Mary Shelley changed the name. <laughs> um, right. Which which one's better? I'm not sure. <laughs> right. Yeah, they're both kind of goofy in their own way. <laughs> yeah. 100%. 100%. Yeah. But it turns uh, out, uh, yeah, the surgeon guy we're looking for, he has a death wish that he shared with Allwine. So it's kind of like a suicide pact. Yeah. So the surgeon killed Allwine, and now the surgeon wants you to catch him so that you can kill him. Kill him. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. And Deucalion's like, you know, I, I, I can help you, but, like, you're going to have to be the one that ends his life. Very convenient, but okay. Yeah. And then we see... Carson and Sloan together in the uh, you know employee parking garage, and they confront Fry this time. Oh, are we skipping the scene with Victor and Erica at the lab? And she's like, "Is this where I was born?" Oh, was that? Yeah, yeah. I guess that was. Yeah. She's just like, she's like, "Yeah, this is my birthplace." And um, he's like, "Yeah," and she's kind of creeped out by it, you know, like this this weird lab. Well, and he brings up, do you have dreams about this place? And she's like, nope, just nightmares. It's all nightmares. <laughs> yeah. And she kind of implies that she wants to die. Yeah, um, which, that, that's fun. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, it's it's clearly, like, from all wine and, and you know, the the killer, the surgeon. Ideation is yeah, happening here. Yeah, it seems that, like, some, you know, Victor thinks he's created a master race, but there's clearly a failing here because they the one thing they seem to have in common is, like, they don't want to go on. Right. Um, we have uh, about four out of uh, maybe six or seven <laughs> that are like, we would like this to stop, please. But yeah, so then then we get to Carson and Sloan at the, the garage, and they found Fry by himself without Harker. And they're like, what's your take on this whole surgeon case, or like the all wine stuff specifically? And he's like, I don't have one. I don't care. I'm. It's it's your case. Right, I'm not interested. Um, and she's like, well, what about the, the room with the razor blades? Yeah, and he's like, what are you what? talking about? And she's like, you know, at Allwine's apartment. And he's like, I didn't go to Allwine's apartment. I don't know anything about what's going on there. But Harker did. Yeah, so that's interesting. If they're partners, like, it's safe to assume that they should have gone together. Were right. you know, were this, you know, an investigation type of thing. Right. Clearly it's not. So, yeah. Hmm. So then I think we cut back to... Yeah, Victor and Erica. Yeah, and Victor kisses her and then pushes her underwater in this, like, tank thing and, and drowns right. her. He's like, it's it's really hard for me. I'm a creator, not a destroyer. Okay, uh huh. You, you do pretty good for the on the destruction aspect. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Twist my arm. I guess I, I guess I could murder you. Um, right. And, and you know, so he's like, she wants to drown, and he wants to drown her. But like, he still like he lets her come up a couple of times to get air, and then shuts her back. To, like right. he's intentionally making this, prolonging yes. this, and making it more unpleasant and painful for her. Uh, right. And when it's over with, he smiles. Like, he is enjoying well, he even, this. He even tells her, your sacrifice will bring perfection to humanity. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, he has this, this idea that, you know, each time that he replaces, you know, someone in his stable, that the next one will be better in some way. Right. And then he just picks up a phone and is like, all right, her body's ready. You can come get her down Clearly, in the lab. Yeah. So he knew, like, the, you know, he knew he, that she, this was going to happen. Like, the, the people on the phone were already expecting this call. Yep. And then we get Carson and Sloan driving around, and she's now ready to kind of fill him in. And she she tells him everything. Sloan is like, "Wait, n no, like that that it's it's way too you know." Harker's the killer is a lot to process, and he's like, "Maybe yeah. I could believe that," but the he is Franken creepy after all. Yeah, yeah, but like the that there's Frankenstein monster like this is this is way too much. She's like, "Where did you find all this out? Do you have like some?" 
informant that just knows all this? And she's like, yeah, it was an informant with two hearts. hearts. Yeah. Um, mm. So then we cut to a, a girl we haven't seen before. She seems a little tipsy. She's kind of stumbling up the stairs in an apartment building. She's singing a jolly song. Yeah. And there's several points where we see her stepping on, like, broken light bulbs on the ground. Yeah. And that never really pans out to anything. Like, nope. it seems like either it's going to be she's going to get hurt with the glass or she's going to get to some place dark because someone has broken the light bulbs. But neither one of those turn out to be the case. Yeah, that's what you call the uh, 2000s uh, music video, uh, like, senses for mm-hmm. the, uh, the, or the instincts. <laughs> yeah. She gets upstairs to her, to her apartment and uh, can't get inside. Like, she's lost her keys or, or they're not working or something. Then her neighbor steps out, and it's Harker. Michael Batson. Yeah, Harker. and he's like, hey, you, are you locked out? And she's like, yeah, yeah, I think so. And he's like, well, why don't you come hang out in my place? We can call the super. They can, you know, come help you get into your place, and you can just stay here until then. Yeah. And so, yep, she agrees and goes in. And while that's going on, we're back with Carson and Sloan. Carson's like, you know, I, Harker was made by this this Victor Helios as well. Right. He was his funeral buddy. Yeah. And, you know, uh, Sloan is still like, this is way too much. I can't believe all that's the case. So um, now we cut back to the girl named Jenna, who's tied up over a toilet, bent mm-hmm. over. Yeah. She's like gagged and like bound to the, to the toilet. And uh, Harker is cutting off her clothes with surgical scissors. And then we're, the, the detectives all kind of like arrive outside the building at that point. Right. But you know Connor means business because she busts out the shotgun. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So she's got the shotgun. Sloan's got, you know, just a, a pistol. And mm-hmm. he's like, okay, maybe I can buy Harker being the killer. Right. He's creepy. But, but that doesn't make him some kind of Frankenstein. And she's like, no, Frankenstein's the doctor. Yeah, Harker's the, the monster. Yeah. yeah. And so they burst into the apartment at that point. They find Jenna bound up. And Harker runs out the, the back at that point. But not only does, does he run out the back, he runs up onto the roof. O'Connor tries to corner him there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, she... he does a he, he takes a dive. Mm-hmm. Just jumps off the roof of the building, hits the ground. You know, he's like, looks like he's dead. And then all of a sudden he turns, looks at her, gets up and runs away. Okay. So now we pretty much have evidence that this is all the evidence you need that Harker is superhuman. Yeah. So, so now let's cut back to Helios making a milky white person. Yeah. Yeah. So we have now like, it's the new Mrs. Helios and she's like covered in like gray mud basically. And she's in this like weird tank. She looks like a robot. She's got like, tubes coming out of her and everything. Yeah. Um, and when he revives her, she does like some weird, like the jittery dance that was really popular movement around that time. <laughs> right. Yeah. Almost like Ringu or something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. So then back at the crime scene, you know, Sloan is like, okay, I'm, uh, I'm starting to buy this. Like if he jumped off the roof and hit the ground uh, and then was able to, you know, get in his car and speed away. The, the right. But how are we going to tell everybody that, you know, this person's a superhuman? Yeah. She's like, oh, I'm not. I'm going to lie about it. <laughs> yeah. And he's like, yeah, yeah, that's smart. Like, we definitely don't want this in the report. Yeah. Which, hey, there we go. Smart protagonist. You love to see it. <laughs> right. And then they start talking to the to Jenna, the, the neighbor girl. And she's like, yeah, you know, I mean, he seemed normal to me. Like, he was just this nice, quiet guy who lived down the hall. Talk to him occasionally, you know, every now and then. If we were both, like, bored, we might, like, get dinner together. You know, right. sometimes he would cook or I would cook. And, like, yeah, but he just seemed like the, the nice guy next door. The son of a bitch made a really nice lasagna. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was funny. Yep. <laughs> then the, the detectives go to talk to Fry. And he's like, are you here for an apology? Because, I, yeah, I'm, I'm beating myself up. I don't know how I didn't know See that my this. partner was a killer. Right. Um, it's wild to think I spent so many years sitting next to this guy in a car and had no idea what he was up to. Yeah. But he's he's kind of a dick to that. Like, he's still not apologetic. He's just no. like, yeah. Don't. He's an asshole. Yeah. Um, but, but he's he, like, hey, listen, I'll show you where he really lived. Yeah, so it turns out, like, behind uh, Harker's apartment, there's, like, he found, uh, there's, like, a secret staircase that leads to an attic that had been boarded up. It's, like, his creepy lair. Right. Um, With a wall of fridges. Mm-hmm. Like, that's a new one on me. Okay. Yeah. And there's, like, some religious art hanging on the walls and stuff. Like, you know, good old just creepy serial killer lair. You got to. Uh, yeah. And then back at Helios's house, the uh, the new Mrs. Helios has been cleaned up and dressed. 
and she is performing ballet for uh, for Victor. Yeah. And he's like, and "You're you're you're doing well, but we'll we'll hire you a trainer so that you can be perfect." Right. But and she says something that's very interesting and different from the other Erica. She's like, "You know, I understand you say I need instruction, but I'd rather follow my instincts." Mhm. Hmm. And then she grabs him with her leg and brings him in. Mhm. So it's kind of like she's she's developing more agency. Yeah, and she even says, "I don't think you brought me into this world to be an automaton." And he just like looks at her and he's like, "I brought you into this world to be my wife." Like, like yes, yes yeah, you, you are, are to be an automaton. You're supposed to do exactly what I want. So yeah. things are not going well with this new Erica right out of the gate. Right, but I feel like you know they're setting it up. Obviously, she's going to be at least a match for him, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or it seems that way. Yeah. Then Carson takes Sloane to finally meet Decalion. They go to the theater, and Decalion's like, you failed. You let him get away. You know, she was like, I thought you said he wanted to die. And he was like, yeah, but he also has instincts that are going right. to keep him from doing that. You've got to try. So it's not just something you could just force him to do. He's going mm-hmm. to fight you over it. Yeah. And then we see Harker. He has gone to the church and is talking to Father Patrick. Yeah, and of course, Father Patrick brought him here for, uh, what is it called? Sanctuary. S- sanctuary, yeah. Yeah. And Patrick's like, you know, I think that there's a way that we could possibly be a part of the human race. Like, I, I don't think we have to be something separate. And Harker's right. like, no, we Victor can... denied us that possibility. Like, he took away anything that would allow us to do that. Right, he's denied us everything, even a family. Yeah, yeah, we can't even reproduce, but I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to give birth. Right. And he raises his shirt. Right. <laughs> there's, there's little hands sticking through his, his belly. Yeah, it's like he, moving around. Mommy. Yeah. Patrick's like, you need to go see Victor. Like, you need his help. Yeah. Something's going on here. He needs to fix you. Mm-hmm. But then suddenly the, there's like a doorbell ringing, which I wouldn't think that a church would have a doorbell. But right, that's, yeah. <laughs> Maybe this apartment has yeah, one. I, I guess. But so sure. Harker, you know, disappears, and um, Patrick goes to check on the door, and it's it's Victor. And this this conversation is super tense. He's like, "Hey, buddy, why well, haven't he- I heard from you?" And yeah, and Patrick's like, I, "You know, I haven't. I've, I've been checking around. I haven't heard anything. I don't know anything." He's like, "You're the expert on God here, right? So, can God be deceived by his followers?" Yeah, and Patrick's which, like, "No, of course not." Which is like, "Oh no, he knows." <laughs> yeah, and Victor's like, "Well, if if not, then why do people lie to their God all the time? Like, that's everyone lies to God constantly." And, you know, Patrick's like, yeah, well, they're, you know, people are... They're human. Uh, they're weak. Yeah, yeah. And... Victor's like, yeah, that's why I made you guys. Yeah. And then he kills Patrick. Wow. Uh, so, yep, Victor definitely knew and was, you know, not happy about that betrayal. That's a great way to inspire, uh, you know, confidence in your subordinates by killing them <laughs> on a regular. <laughs> right. Yeah. And so then we cut away to the detectives who have taken Decalion to see uh, Harker's secret lair. Decalion's like walking around and they're like, we've searched this place up and down. There's there's nothing. And he goes over to this poster. I think it's of the Virgin Mary, right? It's some kind of religious something. Oh, uh, Jesus, I thought. Oh, it might have been. Yeah, yeah. I know it was like one of those kind of like Sacred Heart pictures, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, sacred Heart, as we mentioned earlier, you know, the the, the tattoo and everything. So he... He tears the poster off the wall and then just, like, punches a hole through the wall there. Right. Um, and pulls and, out a Tupperware bowl covered in plaster. Yeah, and inside is an actual heart wrapped in real thorns to, made to look like one of the, the sacred hearts. Right. And, yeah, Decalion's like, you know, the, clearly, like, he's made some attachment to religion. Like, this, this heart, you know, this means something to him. Right. He kind of makes the logical steps of, okay, so he must have known the other people he's killed. Every person mm-hmm. he killed, he must have known them. Yeah. Somebody that he thought was complete, and he was trying to take something from them to make himself more complete. Right. So uh, who's somebody else he knows who's complete that he knows? Yeah, and Carson's like, oh, no, it's <laughs> it's Kathleen. Kathleen's right. the next victim. Yep. So we cut away to Kathleen's house where Harker uh, just bursts through the door. Right. Uh, like, he has no chill. Yeah, it was just like Kool Aid Man's through the door, and like, mm-hmm. but she has plenty of chill because she's just like, "Have a seat, let's talk." Like, ha- well, you she's know, trying like, to de-escalate the whole situation, right? Mm-hmm, she's yeah. like, "I need you to sit right there while I somehow alert the police without setting you off." Yeah, and you know, Harker's like, you know, you've got things all figured out. I want to, I want to open you up and see what makes you tick. See if right. I can become like you. 
Right. And she's like, you don't want to kill me. And he's like, I kind of do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so then he, we just see her bound and gagged. And then there's like a table full of tools. And we just see like uh, Harker kind of digging through them, trying to find what he wants. And he picks up a melon baller. And it's like. Right. Out of everything, and, a melon baller. Yeah. Nothing good can come out of that. You know? No. Um, he's scooping something. Yeah. But then before he can make use of it, he doubles over in pain because the the baby's kicking. Right. <laughs> the, the water's breaking. <laughs> right. Uh, and while he's, like, dealing with that pain, our trio of heroes bursts in and, you know, they rescue Kathleen and Harker tries to run away and they chase after him. Yeah, they chase him to a factory that's... An abandoned factory that's just nearby. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just coincidentally a good old abandoned warehouse, like a comic book or something, basically. Or, or like a music video from the two, early 2000s. <laughs> right. Uh, and, yeah, instantly they go inside. And this looks like the basically the boat from the beginning. We've got a bunch of pipes mm-hmm. leaking. There's steam. There's sparks. It's the same kind of thing all over grungy. again. grungy. Yeah, clearly like kind of bookending the beginning. You know, they're chasing him around, and at some point, Harker manages to catch Sloane and is about to throw him off like a catwalk. They're like up high. Um, Right, and he's just screaming, shoot him, shoot the fucker. (laughs) Yeah, Uh, and so Carson does shoot. Harker drops Sloane, but not over the the balcony, so he's fine, and Mm -hmm. Harker rushes away. But he gets caught pretty right away. (laughs) Yeah, he, he, like, runs away, and then we just see, like, now through, like, a window, we see a silhouette of Harker, and somebody grabs him, and then suddenly he's thrown through the window, and it's Decalion, obviously. Defenestration! <laughs> and, and so Harker's like, are you a brother? Which, that's a real f- weird phrase, man. <laughs> right. Decalion's like, no, and he's like, okay, then who are you? And he's like, I was I'm his first. Born. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, he, he then throws him off the catwalk where, you know, he was getting ready to throw, uh, Sloan right. earlier. But because we're so high up, we're not just like three floors up. Now we're like 10 floors for whatever fucking reason. Yeah. And when he hits the ground this time, he, we don't actually see him hit the ground. We just see the trio arrive down at his body and he is yeah. burst wide open and there's an umbilical cord kind of like hanging out of his body. So like right. whatever was inside of him. Has no, come forth no. and, and and gotten away. Yep. Okay, so then we get as we're finishing everything up. Sloan and Carson are like, "Well, we searched everywhere. We couldn't find whatever came out of his body. Yeah. So whatever that was, it's gone now. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Decaling kind of just disappears. Clearly, he doesn't want to make a statement. You know, he's right. he's not going to get involved in this. Um, then we cut to Victor cracking an egg, and Erica is like, "Hey, uh, you've got a call from a detective or something like that." Yeah, so she goes to the to the next room to listen. listens she, in. Yeah, listens in. It's not so he's it's about the detective. So he's not like he's talking to some of his people, but he's like, "I need you to go check on Carson. There's something. Somebody's helping her. This is this is uh, bigger than just two you know detectives." But then he notices e- Erica, or he hears someone else hang up bef- after the other person is hung up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so he's yeah. suspicious of of Erica for sure. And then yeah, at uh, Carson's home, she's talking to Vicky, and she's like, is, "Has anyone been here today?" Mm-hmm. And she's like, "Nope." So sh- she goes up to check on Anthony, and sure enough, Decalion is sitting in there with him. Um, and this, and this is where is, he busts out the bullshit about the, you know, autism mm-hmm. is the next stage in human evolution or some shit like that. Yeah, your brother sees deeply into the true nature of things. And she's like, no, he's autistic. And he's like, right. That's because he sees too much and he's uh, not yet, uh, he can't comprehend Friendly, what he yeah. sees yet. This is um, not Cthulhu, man. Yeah, just bullshit. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so Carson's like, well, it sound, uh, it looks like all the evidence of Harker has been erased just like it was with uh, with Allwine. And Dekalion's like, yeah, you know, that um, that makes sense. Like, clearly Victor it knows we're on his trail and he's trying to cover his tracks. Yeah, he's um, going to eventually replace all of humanity with his special creations and wipe, wipe out the normal people. So yeah. I must defeat him now. Yeah, and but while he's saying all this, he's, like, doing coin tricks, and, like, Anthony's yeah. watching him, and then he's like, I, I could use your help. How about we flip a coin? Right. Um, Heads, you help me out. Uh, tails, you know, I'll do this on my own. Yeah, and so, yeah, he flips it, catches it, he's got his hand over it, and then she puts her hand on top of his, and it's just like, screw fate, and, you know, right. I'm, I'm, I'm going to help you. And then... Early uh, 2000s goth rock. Yeah! 
Yeah, and we <laughs> go into the, the yeah the credits are just like yeah it's you know yeah bad alternative rock and yeah, <laughs> right very, yep and, and so that's that's how we end this. This was a movie, mm-hmm. but yeah. I definitely see why there wasn't anything else. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, like, maybe if it had had time to be a series, they would have gotten some momentum, but yeah. it feels like the, the, the Kuntz novel has some problems, you know, there's it's definitely not perfect. Um, yes. This feels like it manages to lose some of the charm that the novel had. Like, it, it by, you know, I mean, you hear it all the time, the book's better than the movie, and this yeah. is why. Like, they, they had to streamline, they had to cut a lot of stuff, so it yeah. just feels a little clunky, it feels like it's missing some things and you're having to fill in some gaps on your own. And if you, there, you know, there's at least two more characters in the book that are way more interesting than this. Mm hmm. Yeah. It's definitely a case where like they just couldn't fit everything that they needed in. And, you know, if you're a person who has read the book, you can watch the movie and be like, Oh yeah, I know all the stuff that's missing. And it's yeah. nice to see these characters that I care about or whatever, like on the screen. And it kind of hurts when there's like line for line readings Mm. yeah "Mm, yeah so much more but yeah it is it's just like it's one of those things where it's like i you know i like the texas chainsaw remake i like the friday the 13th remake this is not quite as strong as those two uh which is crazy considering that this definitely has a a much more stacked cast of actors than either of those remakes do right it's just yeah it just doesn't quite i think it's it's the nature of that like this was this probably had a tv budget and was gonna be something different and then they had to cobble it together into a movie at the last minute and it's just <clears throat> well yeah. I, I also think that um kind of like what we're talking about it's this is a time capsule mm-hmm. like it is early 2000s like everything about the screens early 2000s there's nothing yeah. that's like this is more modern no mm-hmm. it's not. yeah yeah like you know, a lot of the police interaction stuff feels like early 2000s, like episodes of Law and Order, or yes. you know, um, it's dangerous the, minds, something like that. Yeah, yeah, it's it's definitely in that this time period. Police, you know, I mean, police procedures, police procedures. are always going to be a thing. They're still a thing, but I, that time period was the heyday of like you know CSI, like all the shows right. were police procedurals. Yeah, um, every everybody wanted to be in CSI after that came out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and th- this feels like they were trying to like capture that magic, and not quite succeeding. No, no, they need a little bit more gore, I think. But also, they knew they were going to be on the USA Network, so they're like, eh, maybe not that much. Yeah, yeah, it's one of those. It, it's definitely like trying to please way too many masters and not quite pleasing any of them Idiot. because of that. It, it's just too compromised. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, give it a watch if you got time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's still but, like, fun. have it on the background. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Go. Yeah, you don't need to, like, carefully study it and take notes like we did. <laughs> <laughs> right! <laughs> we did the work so you don't have to. <laughs> exactly. I uh, love yeah. it. Well, uh, Anthony, uh, I mean, are we going to do the ma- birth rebirth thing? <laughs> are we going to do Yes. It? Yeah, I did okay. find it. it was, yes, no, finally. Yeah. We're finally doing birth rebirth. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this obviously... Uh, we this has been on our schedule. We keep having to push it back because it's like it was supposed to hit theaters and streaming at the same time, and then streaming got pushed. But it it is finally available on video on demand. Um, I was able to track it down. So this is a, obviously a new movie that's getting quite a bit of like interesting buzz, and I I have not seen it yet because I you know obviously wanted to hold off to to watch it for this. Um, right. But, yeah. And the good news is the the writer strike is uh, winding down, so this might uh, this you know struck work and all that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. It, it looks like, yeah, as of right now, the, the, there's a deal on the table that looks like it's accepted, and yeah, so that's that's good news all around. But yeah, so it's, this is this is definitely an indie production, and um, I, I've been hearing that it's, uh, you know, we've done a couple things recently that have been a little bit more focused on, like, the, the reality of science, like no telling or something like that, and my understanding is that this might be along those lines, but, uh, you know, I, I don't know too much, so I'm, I'm excited to uh, to get into this one. Yep, absolutely. Sound looks good, and I'm ready to get there. Yeah. All right, Anthony, where can they find us? Uh, yeah, so, you know, we're on all the socials at The Frankencast. Um, you can email us at thefrankencast at gmail.com. You can find us over on YouTube, and you can find us at patreon.com slash thefrankencast, where we're always experimenting, trying new things, and uh, we're, we're, we're getting new people over there, and, and it seems yeah. like people are enjoying it, so... Um, We'd Might be building a community and all that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'd love to have you over there to, to see what we're up to. Yeah, absolutely. Well, anything else we got to say? I think that's it. Well, in that case, to be continued. 
I had to bust out the Decaling right there. <laughs> the movie Decaling. Yeah. <laughs> Looks like you survived another episode. The Freaking Cast is a production of FCR Media. It's hosted by Anthony Bowman and Eric Velasquez. Follow us on Twitter at The Freaking Cast or send us a letter at thefreakingcast at gmail.com. Our cover art is by Amanda Keller. You can find her at Keller Illustrations on Instagram. Our theme music is by Vivek Abhishek. Thanks for listening.